Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point, and we are here for our weekly R. Kelly update. <music> And um, I was just planning on coming on doing like a information type update, kind of addressing some of the questions that you guys had asked me in the comments of my last video. But lo and behold, I woke up, logged on to the internet, and the first thing that popped up was our boy Daryl Johnson doing an interview with, of all people, Gail King. Now, I don't know why anybody in R. Kelly's camp would be talking to Gail King, would be associating themselves with Gail King, but there was Daryl sitting at the news desk, and when I tell y'all, my blood pressure probably went up. <laughs> Listening to this man, I just could not believe um, some of the things that he let come out of his mouth. The man talking about R. Kelly might be suicidal, He's saying, um, Gail King kept asking him, you know, oh, you have a daughter that's 20 years old. Um, would you let her be around R. Kelly? And then he was like, I wouldn't let my daughter be around anybody who um, has been accused of being, he said, accused of being pedophilia. Then he cleaned it up and said accused of being a pedophile. So she asked him like two or three more times. And he was like, listen to me. Um, she would not be around anyone that's been accused and i'm just like dude shut up so then she asked him um you know well, aren't you isn't that a contradiction that you're here representing him but then you're saying that you wouldn't let your daughter your daughter be around him and he was like what i'm saying is my daughter wouldn't be around anybody and i'm just like i was just so lost and confused that you know that they allow first of all who gave him the go-ahead to be on Gail King? And then, you know, we're already coming off of that debacle of a press conference that he held in Atlanta, I think it was last week sometime, and so where the savages confronted him and, you know, talk about they won't jostle, you know, them with their theatrics. But I would think that at that point, and then you remember at the end of that interview, he like walked off with the savages and went around the corner so he would be out of um, camera and recording shots. So we don't know what he said to the savages that day that he walked off with them. And so I'm real confused right now as to whose team um, Daryl Johnson is on. <laughs> like, is he working for or against R. Kelly? So then there was a USA Today article that came out right after the interview. So in this article, they point out, it says, um, and this is a quote from the article, several of Kelly's attorneys have told USA Today that Johnson is neither a lawyer nor a member of Kelly's defense operation with Steve, with Steve Greenberg, who heads Kelly's legal team in Chicago, saying that Johnson, quote, has been acting as a PR person acting as a PR person. Does that mean he really isn't? And so Nicole Blank Becker, one of Kelly's lawyers, told USA Today earlier this month, Johnson offers spiritual advice to Kelly. So I hope that they are distancing themselves from um, Daryl Johnson and that hopefully a statement will be coming out later saying that he's no longer on the team. And I know I had talked about Daryl probably about I know I've talked about him in several videos, but I know about a month ago, you know, there were people in the comments that were basically saying, you know, you always talk about he needs to be fired. Let the man do his job. I'd say the man need to be fired because whatever his job is, it is not working to the benefit of R. Kelly. It is not making R. Kelly look good in the public eye like if you're the crisis manager then you're supposed to be helping him through this crisis and then if you're going to be acting as the pr person and getting out holding press conferences and interviews then you need to be dispelling the things that are coming out about him and telling people you know wait till the facts come out let's hear all the evidence not sitting there like feeding it to this bs with gail king and i'm just like so over oh, Daryl Johnson, so I am waiting on him to be dismissed, and I hope after um, this interview came out that enough people, you know, tagged Steve Greenberg, reached out to Steve Greenberg, and said to him, 
this guy has to go. And then the guy, one of the other things I was going to talk about in this video is one of the new um, lead attorneys on the federal portion of the case. And so hopefully he has some sense and he can go to Steve and tell him that Daryl needs to go. And then speaking of Steve Greenberg, he did an interview and I think it was the interview I talked about in my last video. And so I was like listening to some of the stuff that he said and things that have come out in the media and he kind of off y'all. I'm not sure. So one thing he said, he told the reporters, remember in the, um, remember in the bond hearing where he was fighting for R. Kelly to be able to get bond, he was basically saying that R. Kelly had never missed a court appearance since he's been out on bond with the Chicago charges. And I was sitting there like, no, um, he has missed a hearing. I believe it was the second hearing that he had. R. Kelly didn't show up. And remember when Steve Greenberg went to court, he said that he wasn't there because he wasn't feeling well, that he woke up with a bug or something. And so that's why he wasn't at the hearing. And so he may not think that these little lies don't mean anything, but you never know how they're going to be used down the line. And so he really needs to like think about what he's saying and stop just throwing stuff out there. And then the other thing that he said that I had to go look into was when he was talking about um, R. Kelly doesn't like to travel, which is true, we already know that. But he was saying that, you know, he doesn't even have any stamps in his passport. So when he was saying that, I was like, R. Kelly did a whole tour in South Africa. He actually, I think the tour in South Africa was like in 2013, whenever the Buffet album came out. But before that, I believe it was in 2010 when he went to Africa because he performed at, um, was it the FILA Cup? But it was like the big soccer tournament, the, um, I think with all the countries or whatever compete. So I had to go back and check to see how long a passport is good for. So passports are valid, U.S. passports are valid for 10 years. So I don't know when R. Kelly got his original passport. <laughs> I don't know if he already had it or if he got it to go to Africa in 2010 uh, for that soccer tournament. So if that was the case, then he should have some stamps on his passport. I know not all countries um, stamp passport, you're required to get stamps on the passports, but... Steve Greenberg, come on. And then if he got it before 2010 and he decided, you know, I'm never going to travel again, or maybe he, when he booked those trips in Germany, maybe he went and got a new passport and that's why there's no stamps. But just little things that he says that most people don't pay attention, but other people are picking up on. And so they're like already thinking like, what's up with Steve Greenberg? And so he does things like that, that just gives them more ammunition to say, oh, he's a quiet, he's not a good attorney. So now let's go over to R. Kelly's new federal attorney. Well, the guy that's supposed to be leading um, his federal team name is Mike Leonard and he's a partner in a firm called Leonard and Meyer and it looks like he has a you know pretty impressive resume and I know somebody had commented on the last video that he needs the um, Tom Mesereau guy who was Michael Jackson's attorney and if you guys remember they did reach out to Tom Mesereau to ask him to join the team, but he was working on another case, but he did say that, well, he allegedly, it was reported, <laughs> that he said that he would be interested in joining the legal team and that, you know, but he was working on this case right now, but if, you know, the circumstances align and he's able to join the team, he would love to do so. So perhaps he recommended this guy, we don't know, but it did come out that this was one of his federal attorneys. So as you guys know, um, in the indictment against R. Kelly, two of his former employees or business associates, one was the Daryl McDavid guy who, was, you know, who turned himself in and he was released on $500,000 bond. And then the other person was a Milton June Brown. And I think I called him June Bug in the last video. Uh, but I didn't catch it until afterwards, but June Brown, he actually turned himself in and he was released on his own recognizance. And so that didn't get a lot of coverage. We had coverage of the McDavid guy, 
But um, I just saw like a blurb in an article that I was reading that the brown guy had actually turned himself in and was released. And then there was an interview on, is it V103 with Tigger and the chick and the guy? It's like three of them. Well, they interviewed, um, they interviewed Gerald Griggs and you guys know that that is the Savage's attorney. Uh, Y'all know Tigger is a friend of R. Kelly's. <laughs> so I only clicked on the button because I just wanted to see how he was going to handle the interview and whether he was going to like be attacking R. Kelly or if he was, you know, how was he going to act? So basically he was pretty much quiet for most of the interview. And then when they would put the camera on him, he just looked like, Lord, what is going on? Like, he, it was, I don't know. I, the body language I read was he wanted Gerald Griggs out of his office and he was not going to say anything bad about R. Kelly. And he wasn't going to ask any hard questions to encourage Gerald Griggs to make any more comments. Uh, but basically the lady who was also on the show, she was asking most of the questions. The other guy, you know, he was chiming in and everything, but they were kind of acting like, what, really? And you know, carrying on like that. And every now and then Tigger would jump in and ask a question, but every time the camera would go to him, he would be like, it was like, uh, first of all, when Gerald Green's attorney for the Savage family, Joyce and Savage and Azrael uh, Clary, uh, R. Kelly's uh, living girlfriends, if you will, or uh, members of his sex cult, depending on who you ask. Right. Um, yeah. But basically, uh, Gerald Griggs is on there with that same song and dance. You know, they just want to see their daughter. They just want to, you know, have an open line of communication. Sir, they've had opportunities to have an open line of communication, and they have blown that open lines of communication every time. And so, you know, they were asking them, well, the girls are there by themselves. Why won't they go to Trump Towers now that he's claiming, oh, security won't let them in. Um, people in the comments was like, why did y'all ask them why they didn't show up at the courthouse? <laughs> you know, because the girls were there at the courthouse. And I said I was going to stop calling them girls. The young women were at the courthouse. So when Gerald Griggs was on V103 doing this interview with Big Tigger, he, you know, was going on and on. So Tigger had brought up the fact that Azrael and Jocelyn had did the video letting people know that they were okay and that they were still at Trump Tower. And so Griggs was sitting there saying, you know, well, we don't know when that video was recorded. It could have been recorded anytime. But you guys know in that video, when it starts out, Azrael says that, you know, they are responding to the rumors that they had been evicted. And then she even pulls puts the dog in the view and lets everybody know and let everybody know that the dog was okay. The dog name is Believe because remember R. Kelly was out walking the dog when he was apprehended by the feds. So I don't know why Griggs, um, Gerald Griggs, get out here, the savages. And oh, on the subject of Angelo Clary, in my last video, I talked about how both him and Tim Savage had put out videos last week where they were saying they were going on a social media fast. They weren't going to be on social media. And then the very next day, they were both back on social media. So Angelo Clary did an interview with Tasha Kay and then... A couple of days later, Tim Savage put out this video that was hilarious where it was like, it was a collage of pictures of Jocelyn, I guess, from a little girl up. And so people were commenting on the video talking about, damn, did she die? Because it was sort of like one of those memorial videos that people put out or they play at the funerals. And so it was an epic failure, okay, if he was trying to get um, Jocelyn's attention. So they... So they both went back on their word about being off of social media for a while. Don't know why they won't call their parents. And so then people were arguing, you know, oh, there must be something wrong with um, with them. You know, they've got to be brainwashed. Who wouldn't want to talk to their parents? Listen, let me tell y'all something. There are a lot of people in this world today who have zero 
contact with their family. There are people that have been molested and their parents didn't take up for them or that they were abused and maybe the parents were the abusers. There are a lot of reasons. Uh, maybe, you know, the parents were poor and they didn't like being poor and now they even became successful and distanced themselves from their parents. There are a laundry list of reasons why people don't talk to their parents. And when I say don't talk to their parents, like walked out the door five, 10 years ago and never returned, don't talk to their parents. So don't act like it's odd that somebody doesn't talk to their parents. And then there are parents who have kicked their children out and the children are out there fending for themselves. And so they don't have a relationship. And then the other thing that people keep saying is, well, when the money's gone, they're going to have to go home. You know, they ain't going to have no option. Um, there's always options because in the United States of America, where we live, when children turn 18 and they age out of the foster care system, thousands of people age out of the foster care system every day and they are on their own. Like the government will give them, you know, they'll get Section 8 if they can find somewhere to live. Sometimes they give them money to go to college, but for the most part, they are on their own. They have to make their own way. There are like organizations that help them, give them housing, you know, so that they can get their footing and start their own life, get jobs and stuff. So basically, if the money runs out, if they get evicted from Trump Tower, they can do what everybody else do. They can get a job and they can figure it out. Um, if they don't want to go back home, there is no reason why they have to go home. And I know Angelo Clary said that, you know, he would give them money to get an apartment and help them financially and all of that. But you're just taking them from one codependent situation to another codependent situation. And it is time for them to learn how to stand on their own and to make their own way in, their, in this world, whether R. Kelly gets out or not whether they decide to go home to their parents or not, they still have to figure out how to make life work for them. about the fact that the land fairs um, were being represented by an attorney by the name of Christopher Brown. And so they had done an interview with TMZ and basically they were saying that, you know, they weren't changing their story, that they were given the same story that they gave before, that they weren't paid off and that, you know, it wasn't Rashana in the video, in the video that was circulating around. And so after that, stories started coming out that was quoting that they were cooperating, that Rashana was cooperating, but it didn't give any of the information that was from the TMZ article or the quotes from the attorney. And then that story was kind of hot for about two or three days. And then it too died down and we haven't heard any more. So we don't know what cooperating with the feds mean. It, does it mean that they've come in, they've sat down, they're answering questions, or does it mean that she's changed her story from when she was you know, interviewed by investigators back in the 2008 trial. So we don't know what cooperating means, but we do know that according to this attorney, the father is saying that they weren't paid off, that these stories about them receiving the $2 million 
as a payoff and being sent out of the country wasn't true. So we don't know if they got evidence to the contrary and what this will mean for, you know, the, the father and the mother and the other people that testified. And then with Rashawn, it was just really weird that they were saying that she was cooperating, but then it came out that she actually had gone in and talked to these um, Cook County prosecutors that there were stories circulating that um, she had gone in and spoken to them, but nobody knew about it. And so we don't know if she held on to her story from the previous trial and then maybe with the feds coming in, they're thinking that they can break her and make her change her story. Because I'm thinking if she told Kim Fox and her team that it was her in the video, they would have ran with that. We would have known about that. And so it's just so weird. And then also weird is the fact that they turned over that DVD to, to Steve Greenberg at that last status hearing. And we have not heard nothing. Like it has gone silent, gone dead. We don't know. Because I know that there's a protective order on the DVD that it can't be shown to anybody else. But seemed like they would have came out and said, oh, it's definitely not him. I don't, I don't know. I just thought that was weird that it's gone dead. Or maybe it's because the, then on the flip side of it, it could be that the Cook County prosecution knew they didn't have a case with that DVD. And so they hurry up and told the, you know, and it was already planned that, that once they turned over the DVD, they had installed as long as they could, that that's when the feds would swoop in and take our fo focus off the fact that that DVD was handed over and, you know, bring out these charges so we would forget all about it. So that was really weird to me. Um, federal cases typically supersede state level cases. So we don't know if that all this, 15th um, hearing is going to take place or not. I'm going to um, go on the ledge and say that it probably won't take place, but we'll have to wait and see if he's just facing the August 2nd arraignment and then the September 4th hearing, or if they are going to move forward um, with the state case and, you know, have those hearings going on. I'm sure we'll find that out in the next couple of weeks or so. So it was announced the other day that R. Kelly will be taken to New York to be arraigned in New York. So that's going to happen on August 2nd. And so Steve Greenberg came out and said that, you know, they're going to move him. They're not going to inform him or tell him what's going on. You know, he won't be included, you know, so he was going on and on and I'm sitting there saying, well, you know, they do that for security reasons. And I don't know how many of you watch power, but don't you remember when they were transporting the guy and ghost them, um, you know, commandeered the vehicle and they had the, sh uh, the shootout. Remember the crazy, I can't remember, was that the crazy guy who eventually I think ended up getting killed anyway, but Loco, what was his name? <laughs> but anyway, they do that for security reasons because they don't want anybody to be trying to, you know, interrupt the transport, the transportation aspect. Now I have been on, um, airplanes before where U.S. Marshals were transporting prisoners. So I don't know if they're going to put him on a commercial flight. I'm thinking that they probably won't because of his celebrity. Um, they can put him in a van and transport him in a van. You guys remember that movie where they were transporting the prisoners in the airplane and then the airplane got hijacked and everything. So those are the reasons why they don't tell anybody their plans. But trust me, Steve Greenberg will be notified before R. Kelly is taken out of that prison. It might be an hour before he's taken out, but he will be notified. And then something else that people should know is that when somebody is convicted of a federal crime, and hopefully it doesn't get to that point, but in the event that he is convicted, federal prisoners rarely serve out their entire term in the same prison. They get moved around like every five, six, seven years, they get moved. I mean, like moved all over the country to different facilities. So that's something that, you know, he may have to deal with in the future as well. And then there was an interview with TMZ with Nicole Becker. And so she told them that the singer 
admitted during a recent visit at the prison that to being content in solitary confinement because remember Steve Greenberg came out and said you know he was in the hole and when people think of the hole you know they think of prisoners who are being punished and, you know and they get put into this little small room with no windows no lights no you know the only time they have interactions with anybody is when the guard you know slips them the food through the door and so people had all these images and they were getting upset so nicole you know basically was saying that he was in solitary confinement and that he preferred to be there over being in the general population as he believes that his life would be in danger not sure why if he was um, in the general population. And then Becker says that Kelly is fearful of retaliation from inmates over the accusations which have landed him behind bars. And so again, I think feeding into the frenzy of what people say, like if you go to jail, you know, they're gonna kill you, beat you up or whatever, if it's a crime against a minor. But we all know that there are plenty of people who are serving time in prison um, that, that, did, not serve, that did not have that faith. And so he goes on to say that the judge ruled Tuesday that Kelly would be held without bail, you know, until he awaits his next hearing in Illinois, which is September 4th. So on, on August 2nd, they're going to take him to New York. He's going to be arraigned, you know, enter his plea, and then they're going to transport him back to Chicago so that he's back in time for that September 4th hearing. Then after she did that interview, it came out <laughs> that he has since been moved. So I believe this article came from CNN and it basically said that he um, had been moved to a, he's still in solitary confinement, but I guess it's like in a bigger cell and he has more access to things. Um, Steve Greenberg says that um, he wants his computer so he can finish up the record album he has been working on, so we've been hearing about this album now for about a year, so I guess he's still working on it. Um, he says that my client needs to make money and he has been precluded from doing so because of his legal situation. An article goes on to say, although legal filings contend that Kelly has a serious learning disability affecting his ability to read, Greenberg added, um, basketball got him through grammar school and although he couldn't read or write, he had a high school music teacher who taught him to learn music and sing before he dropped out of high school. And he says, so he sang in subways for money, went to California, hoping to be discovered singing on the street corners came back to Chicago to continue street singing and finally made it. Um, Greenberg claims he is also getting inundated with calls from people who are concerned and support Kelly. And I'm told that the jail has been inundated with calls from people who are also concerned and sending their support. And I know there is a campaign um, where people are writing, you know, sending cards and letters um, to R. Kelly. And so, don't know how that's going to work out that they're saying he can't read um who's going to read the cards to him but i believe that it was still even if he can't read the cards i think it still would um make him feel good you know to have a hundred letters or a hundred cards show up you know at his um you know show up at his cell you know to encourage him and make him feel better and then if people are sending hate mail then of course, hopefully the jail won't pass those through. And for anybody that is sending uh, mail to him, please know <laughs> that they read everything that you send. They read it and they scan it. So don't be uh, sending those salacious letters. And Because actually I don't even think they would pass on a letter that has sexual innuendo or anything. But I don't see anything wrong with just sending a card, you know, saying that you support him or whatever. And actually at the end of the video, I will drop the address and the um, inmate number that you have to have on there to send letters to him. And Greenberg went on to say that Azriel and Jocelyn, are going through the Bureau of Prisoners process um, to see him and that he knows that some of his friends are going to his favorite restaurant. Um, one was called Gibson's and the other one Tavern on the Rush, which I mentioned in another video, um, to have them send him a steak dinner. So I don't know if you can be getting steak dinners at the prison. <laughs> they're going to allow that to happen. But anyway, they're trying to um, work it out where these people can send him a special meal. 
And oh, then there was a story that I came across where Dave Chappelle was stopped while he was out. And, you know, he was asked, you know, what do you think about the new charges against R. Kelly? And Dave Chappelle basically said that um, he was not going to discuss R. Kelly. So please stop asking him about R. Kelly. So next there was an interview with Dream Hampton. You know, so she done had a whole bunch to say lately. But she's kind of, surprisingly, she's not like in full attack mode, full I told you so mode. But she just keeps putting out these little tweets, you know, about R. Kelly and about the whole situation. So in a recent interview, um, she basically said that she never expected that the documentary would lead, you know, would be so impactful and lead to these charges. And so she says, I didn't think that the case against R. Kelly would be relitigated. What I'd hoped for was what happened to SeaWorld after Blackfish came out, she told the Los Angeles Times. Um, I wanted people to turn away from him, to stop playing his music at weddings and barbecues, or at least for people to go to the DJ and make them answer to that. I wanted the music industry to answer to that. And so, you know, once again, I want to take his money away from him, but don't want him to go to jail. And that's the same thing that Angelo Clary keeps preaching. You know, I want him to be humble. I want his money and his fame to be taken away from him, but I don't want to go, want him to go to jail. And I think that's sort of like systemic of what's going on in communities around the world where people are, you know, we talk a lot about how, People who claim that they have been sexually assaulted or raped or whatever are kind of living vicariously through this whole situation that's going on with R. Kelly. And rather than go and call out their accuser and, you know, stand up and say, you know, my father, my uncle, my neighbor, whoever was molesting me as I was growing up. They hold on to that secret, but then they're sitting there rooting and championing on the people that are coming after R. Kelly and, you know, talking about R. Kelly as though R. Kelly was the one that did whatever to them. And so when I read statements like this from Dream Hampton and hear the savages and the Clarys and all these people saying, well, I don't want him to go to jail. And I think even a crazy Geronda Pace even makes the same statements like, you know, I want him to get help. I don't want him to go to jail. And so it's like, either you do or you don't. Okay. <laughs> like what is really going on in y'all minds right now? Because I'm thinking if somebody molested or raped me or molested or raped my, one of my daughters, they would have been in jail a long time ago. It wouldn't be no compromise and wavering and, and all of this stuff, you know, cause I can pray for you while you're behind bars. So it's just like a mixed bag, a mixed emotion of what they're going through now that they see what their actions have caused, like what has resulted from all of this. And then that also um, reminded me that I was going to talk about how they're saying that the reason the feds actually stepped in was because Kim Fox's case was so weak, <laughs> you know, like they didn't think that the Chicago people would have been able to get a guilty verdict. And so that's why they're adding on to all these charges, adding on to all these charges. And then speaking of Kim Fox, her friend, Michael Avenatti. Now you guys remember in my last video, I said that Michael Avenatti was putting on these fake press conferences and how you can compare like the microphone stands from the, the press conferences after the hearings and compared to the microphones that were on the stand where he was supposedly at this hotel in Chicago, which I don't think we ever found out if he was really at that. I think it was the Four Seasons. But anyway, so he did another press conference where he was talking about something that came up with Donald Trump and some um, documents were released with Michael Cohen and his statements and testimony to the Department of Justice. So anyway... He's having this doggone press conference, y'all. And I'm just going to drop the video below and let y'all see what happened and give y'all a good chuckle, okay?
So moving on, <laughs> um, I came across um, another article and it was called Eight Things to Know About the R. Kelly Accusations. And so I'm just going to read part of it to you. So it says, here are eight things you should know about the sexual misconduct accusations against R. Kelly. And then it says, um, R. Kelly was indicted with 18 federal charges earlier this month, including allegedly taking underage girls across state lines for sex. And so let me put a little pen right here before I forget. So remember the Clarys came out with these um, plane tickets. It was supposed to be a plane ticket for Azrael flying from Chicago back to Orlando. And remember I was telling you guys that R. Kelly actually performed at the San Diego Jazz Festival on that Friday night, which was May 22nd. And so this return flight was May 25th. And I always ask the question, why don't we see the plane ticket where she flew out there? Can we get the manifesto from the, well, they might not call it a manifesto, but can we get like, the list of all the passengers that was on that plane so we can see if the sister, because remember when all of this started coming out, Azrael had a sister, a Clarice or something like that, who was actually with her when she first met R. Kelly, when she was going to stay with R. Kelly or whatever was supposed to be going on, she had an older sister that was with her. And so what we need to know was, was she on that plane also or was the mother on the plane? But what I did uncover this past week was an article that was in BuzzFeed where they were interviewing the parents of, they were interviewing Jonjolin and Tim Savage, and this was back from 2017 when everything started hitting the fan. And in that article, they talk about that same concert and how they flew to California on May 24th and met with R. Kelly. So I'm thinking, and how they thought, you know, he was going to get Jocelyn into this music career. And so I'm thinking that picture that's going around of Jonjolin, um, Jonjolin, the little sister Jay or Jai Savage, whatever her name is, and Jocelyn, where they're in that picture with R. Kelly, that may have been taken when they were in, Cle in um, California. And so I thought that was interesting that both Azriel and Jocelyn and her mom were also in California that same weekend. And so I wonder if they ran into each other because they, I don't know. But anyway, I thought that was an interesting tidbit. So let me go back to this article I was reading to you guys. So it says, so let's skip the part. We know about the indictment. And some of the stuff um, in these eight things we already know, like several federal indictments were filed in both Chicago and Brooklyn and then what those charges were. And then it says that, you know, the federal investigation came about after a Homeland Security agent watched the Lifetime docuseries. And then it goes on to say that the agent was, quote, looking at the victim's interviews and realized that this is so much bigger than what, was pre what he was previously charged with, you know, so they had to go to work and come up with some more charges. And it says that in her interview with the LA Times, Hampton says that Kelly has never shown a willingness to change despite being acquitted in his 2008 trial. And once again, if people claim that they haven't done what you've accused them of doing, then what is it that they're supposed to change? And then it says that between the 2008 trials and now there were more alleged victims. This is not a man who was willing to face his alleged crimes and face his sickness. He wasn't interested in restorative justice. Look at that performance with Gail King, she said, referencing um, Kelly's infamous interview with CBS this morning. And then she went on to say, we'd be living in a different country if men said, quote, I did terrible things and I don't want to be that man anymore. I want to not be an abusive person anymore. Instead of gaslighting us, that would have gone a lot further than any conviction or healing in this country. And then the last thing was, you know, when I was doing the research for you guys to get some more, you know, technical information, I did come across this. It was differentiating from 
state crimes that are prosecuted and federal crimes. And so it says in the United States, there are two kinds of courts, state courts and federal courts. The state courts have been established by each state and are located in cities and countries. In contrast, federal courts are established under the U.S. Constitution to handle disputes involving the Constitution and laws which were passed by Congress. And remember, there's 93 districts, um, federal districts in the United States. So state courts have a lot of power. So most cases involving individuals will be heard in state courts, for example, will be heard in state courts. For example, the state courts will handle cases involving family law disputes, robberies, burglaries, theft, and broken contracts. The state courts will not hear cases involving specific federal laws, such as criminal, antitrust, bankruptcy, patent, and copyrights. A vast majority of criminal cases involving violations of state laws are heard in state courts, but cases which involving violations of federal laws can be diverted to federal court. There are some instances where both federal and state courts have jurisdiction. When, the, when this occurs, the parties choose whether to go to state or federal court. And so that's similar to what happened here. They started out with the state charges and, you know, as people were saying, the case wasn't strong enough. So the feds jumped in because they had more leeway to, you know, bring in charges like racketeering and that type of stuff. So it says a federal crime or federal offense is a crime that is made illegal by federal legislation. In the U.S., people can be prosecuted at either the state or federal level. As stated above, the majority of criminal offenses are prosecuted at the state level. However, a federal offense will be prosecuted in federal court. So certain aggravated or more serious sex crimes are federal offenses in this country. If a person is convicted of a federal sex crime, they could be facing mandatory minimum sentencing in addition to spending years in prison, probation or parole and fines. They are also facing mandatory sex offender registration. And so, you know, when you go through the federal courts, they have guidelines and they stick to those guidelines. And so remember when the state charges were brought, they were saying that he could face three to seven years on each count or the possibility of probation. And so we also have seen cases where these judges are basically suspending sentences. They're, you know, saying, oh, well, this person has a promising future, so we're only going to give them 60 days or we're going to give them community service when they have committed these sick, these sex crimes against people or rape somebody and they're getting off being able to go home. But with the federal charges, the judge doesn't have that leeway. If the federal charges say a minimum of 10 years, you're going to get that minimum of 10 years of whatever the um, length of the case is. And I think with the Chicago charges against him, he's facing like potentially 195 years, which is usually like the maximum of all the charges added together. And as I explained previously, char um, sentences can run concurrent or they can run consecutively. And concurrent means that if you're found guilty on seven charges and each charge comes with five years penalty, then instead of serving 35 years, you would serve five years because you would be serving all seven sentences at the same time. And then consecutively means that you would serve the one sentence five years, then another five years, then another five years, and then you would spend that 35 years in prison. So it says when a person is required to register on the National Sex Offender Registry, their name, address, headshot, and description of their offense will be publicly posted. This means that anyone can have access to such private information for years to come. Sex offender registration can also limit where you live and where you can be. Limits can be placed on how close you can go to a school campus or public park. And I remember last year, when, well, in 2017, when Hurricane Irma hit, there was a story in the news because people were saying, where do sex offenders go when there's a hurricane? Do they get to go to the shelters where other people are? And then how do you know if there's a sex offender in the shelter with you? And so some of the local police um, 
police departments came out and were talking about, you know, how they do things. And so in one county, they say that they actually go and round up all the people in their county who are sex offenders and then they take them to the jail and keep them at the jail. Other places say that they have police at the different shelters and then when people come in, they actually run their names. And then if they are found on the sex offender register, registry, they're taken to another part of the shelter. So, you know, shelters are usually at high schools or like arenas and that type of thing. So they have a special section for sex offenders. So just a little bit of information there. So it says another less widely known fact about being convicted of a federal sex crime is that you might be sent to a federal medical center, which is a federal bureau of prisons facility. These facilities treat the terminally ill, the mentally ill and sex offenders. Inmates with a sex offender history are enrolled in the residential sex offender treatment program or sex offender management program. And whether inmates like it or not, they are expected to submit to these intensive treatment programs along with other sex offenders. And it goes on to say, what sex crimes fall under the category of federal sex crimes? First of all, most sex crimes involving children, such as sexual assault, rape, possession of child pornography, or dis distribution of child pornography are considered federal crimes and the list of federal crimes is quite extensive. However, some common examples of federal sex crimes include aggravated sexual abuse, repeat offenders, sexual exploitation of children, human trafficking, sexual abuse of a minor, um, sexual abuse resulting in death, selling or buying children for sexual purposes, and many more. And then it says, being convicted of a federal sex crime can ruin your reputation and your livelihood. Not only would you be facing years in prison, but mandatory sex offender registration as well. Being labeled a sex offender will affect your ability to get housing, employment, and higher education. Um, no matter what brought you to those charges, it's essential that you consult with an experienced federal criminal attorney who defends such complex cases. And then um, you guys were talking about the statute of limitations. So I looked that up. Okay, so this is another document um, that came from the federal um, court's website. And so it says that attachment one, periods of limitation for specific federal crimes. And so for crimes that you commit on the federal level that have no limitation, um, it talks about death penalty offenses. Now this list went on so long about what you can get the death penalty for, okay? And there is no statute of limitations on all these. It was about two pages long. So basically there's no statute of limitations and you can get the death penalty anytime you're brought up on a federal charge that includes murder or the death of a child, you know, that is involved with terrorism, acts of violence, um, while drug trafficking, while you know, doing something on a federal, um, federal property. If you, if a federal prisoner kills somebody, they can get the death penalty and there's no limit, statute of limitations on, um, how long those charges can be brought. And so then it goes on to child abduction and sex offenses. So kidnapping a child, sex trafficking by force fraud of a child, aggravated sexual abuse, sexual abuse, sexual abuse of a ward of a child, abusive sexual contact, sexual abuse resulting in death. And when I tell y'all, they got a hundred different uh, titles that they can use. Transporting, distributing, or selling child sexually exploited material, um, transporting or distributing child pornography, misleading names on the internet, um, making child sexually exploitive material overseas, for export to the U.S., transportation of illicit sexual purposes, coercing or enticing travel for illicit sexual purposes, um, travel involving illicit sexual activity with the child, filing false immigration statement, um, interstate transmission of information about a child relating to illicit sexual activity, um, so all of those things have no statute of limitations. So charges can be brought at any time for any of those occurrences. Um, then they go into things, um, 20 year statute of limitation, um, major art theft, um, things with 10 years, 
statute of limitation, um, arson, receipt of financial institution, officials or commissioners. So basically embezzlement, um, burning or bombing federal property, carrying explosive, um, all different types of fraud. So those things have a 10 year statute of limitation, but basically all the things that he's being accused of do not have a statute of limitation. Whereas on the state level, um, there are statutes of limitation and people keep talking about in Chicago, they passed that law August of 2017, where they removed the statute of limitations for um, child sex crimes, well, abuse of a child. But I keep telling you guys that that law was not retroactive. So anything that happened prior to 2017 has um, limitations on it. And I believe that it has to be reported within so many years. And I think it's 20 years after the person turns the age of 18 that they have to report any sexual abuse that happened to them as a child and they and if it happened prior to august 17 then they have 20 years from their 18th birthday and if it happened after august 2017 then there are no statute of limitations and they can report at any time but it was it was pretty interesting um reading this and just the the number of charges that could be filed against a person for any type of crime and how a lot of them are the same crime, but they just change the terminology by one or two words so that they can just pile charges on to people to try and get a conviction. So anyway, that's it for me. Um, leave your comments below, rate the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.